Thank you everyone to our last uh, panel, discussion panel. Uh, we will proceed uh, in the following order. So first we'll have uh, three uh, commentators from, from Oxford who, uh, who will um, give comments. They, they have seen the text of the contributions and they have seen what will happen uh, before today. So, so uh, that's what they will be addressing. The commentators are not addressing uh, or don't have to address specific contributions, so, so uh, we ask them to, uh, to, to reference the theme of the symposium more, uh, more generally. Um, so first we'll have uh, Nick Barber, Associate Professor of Constitutional Law and our host, because he's, uh, he's a fellow of, the, of uh, Trinity College. Um, then uh, Richard Deakins, associate, also Associate Professor of Law and the fellow of uh, St. John's College. And, and uh, finally, uh, Alison Young, Professor of Public Law uh, and, and the Fellow of uh, Hartford College. Uh, and after, after the commentators um, speak, then we'll have uh, the panelists from the previous two panels sit here and uh, answer questions for the final Q&A. And this will be all for today. So, Nick. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Nicolai. Thank you for organising such an interesting uh, uh, and provocative uh, uh, conference. I think we've, we, the, um, the Oxford contingent, have been drafted in to sort of calm everything down. We're going to, uh, we're going to put our, our special magic, our superhero power, if you like, is, is to make is to yeah. Yeah. Um So after we've spoken, um, I'm sure that all passion will drain from the room. At least that's what, that's what normally happens. That's just what normally happens with me when I, in private life as well. <laughs> um, so I have a few points I want to make, having listened to what was discussed um, this morning, and I don't know um, anywhere near enough about the Polish Constitution or the Polish Constitutional Crisis to speak that directly, but I have a few thoughts. Um, the first remark I wanted to make was to emphasise what has been called the integrative, integrative function of um, constitutions, and that is the way in which constitutions um, accommodate disagreement. And I think it's, in well-functioning constitutions, this is so obvious that you don't see it. It, it sort of disappears, it falls beneath the radar. But in uh, new constitutional orders, and in constitutional orders that are going through uh, difficult periods, the integrative function of the constitution really does come to the fore. And constitutions undertake the integrative uh, function in um, two ways, or at two levels. First and most um, simply, uh, constitutional institutions can sometimes succeed in ending disagreement. They end disagreement. We all have a good old argument, and an outcome is reached, and we accept the outcome. We think it's right. Um, and I think, for example, the debate over the legalisation or the, 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 the removal of capital punishment in the United Kingdom is a good example of this. It was a hot topic. It was debated. A decision was made. And now, I think just about everybody outside a few crazy loons, um, I think that's fair, um, would accept that the, the capital, capital punishment isn't something that the state should pursue. So this is an example of where the constitutional institutions actually ended the debate. Um, secondly, and I think far more commonly, what constitutional in institutions do is they accommodate disagreement by leading citizens to accept the outcome, even though those citizens still disagree with that outcome. And this happens um, all the time. So the people, we accept the position of the state is one thing. We continue to believe it should be something else. But we also accept that that outcome has to be tolerated for now. That this is the, a, a, a legitimate position for the state to adopt. And we have to um, accept it. So um, I think Brexit is a disaster. Um, but I do accept that Parliament was entitled to make this decision. And that's... And so that is an example then of the Constitution playing a really important integrative function. People who disagree over the merits of Brexit accept the product, even if they still think it's wrong. It's worth noting that the accommodation of disagreement also includes the accommodation of disagreement over institutional competence. There's a meta level to the integrative function of constitutions. In a well-functioning constitution, there are structures that allow people to disagree about who gets to decide an issue, but are successful in getting the people to agree on the eventual outcome of that uh, 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 debate. Now, that, I've made that sound mind-blowingly complicated, but really it's quite straightforward. Um, 
in most constitutions, it's the court that has that final say. Um, people may disagree about whether it's the Scottish <coughs> Parliament that gets to decide or, or, or the United Kingdom Parliament, but they agree that the Supreme Court can decide which of those two bodies makes that decision. Again, a good example of this we saw in the Brexit debate. You may have heard, it was remarked upon in the media once or twice, that there was a disagreement about whether or not Parliament or the Executive could decide whether or not to take the United Kingdom out of the European Union. Who got to pull the Article 50 trigger? Now, we are not going back into that debate again. <laughs> but the one thing that pretty much everybody accepted was that the court was able to make this call. The court was able to decide if the Executive had this capacity or the Legislature had this capacity. And even those who disagree with the outcome of Miller accept that that decision is made. Uh, there are even some now who disagree with Miller. <laughs> One or two lonely souls crying in the wilderness. The integrative function has worked on the But it has. The integrative function has been on the first table. I'm being heckled by the other panellists on the stage. At least in the previous sessions, the heckles came from the audience. Now it's the panellists. Um, but even Richard would accept that once the court had decided, he had to accept the court's decision on that matter. The court was able to resolve the disagreement, and the disagreement um, op 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 acted below the level of constitutional institutions taken as a whole. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where Schmidt was right. I don't want anybody to think that I like Carl Schmidt's work or I agree with it, but in one respect, Schmidt was right. It's really important that in the state, the, the, the disagreement is kept below the level of the constitution. Once it reaches the level of the constitution, you either have, um, have to reform the constitution in some way, or you run the, 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 the real, very real risk of a collapse of the state with all the terrible consequences that that might bring. Now, where the constitutional crisis, as it does in Poland, involves the jurisdiction of the courts, things can hardly be more serious, because it's a constitutional crisis involving the very institution that, in almost every other situation, would resolve the constitutional crisis. And I'm telling you what you already know, and I'm speaking the obvious, but I'm a legal academic, and I've made a career of saying the obvious in a very slow and plonking fashion. <laughs> um, we could discuss the role of the court in a constitution all afternoon, but I want to make a few general comments about um, the courts, legislatures, and um, the idea of their, their, their integrative um, function. Now, the integrative function of legislatures is, I think, fostered in part by facilitating debate. <laughs> it's one of the curious features. I, I, I don't know if anybody else has picked up on this, but we, we, we relish and prize and encourage debate within legislatures, but we're worried, or at least in some way uncomfortable, when we have debate within courts. In legislatures, debate is a good thing that should be encouraged. We have a loyal opposition there specifically to create a, a, a debate. Whereas in courts, sure, we have dissent sometimes, but dissent is unusual or uncommon, and in some systems, indeed, dissent isn't uh, uh, permitted. No dissent, dissent in the European Court of Justice. They all speak with uh, uh, one voice in, in that court. Um, why is this? Well, I think it might be because um, the outcome of legislatures is um, provisional, in a sense. And this is a point that Richard has written about um, at great length. Um, we have debate in the legislature. Um, a decision is reached, but people in the legislature know that that decision could be revisited later on. It's something you can uh, uh, come back to. So the debate is good because it brings the community together, they, that this is a forum in which all viewpoints are heard. But it's also uh, 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 um, um, good because it doesn't have to claim that this is the once and for all decision. It might be a decision which is later on. In contrast, in courts, there is a sense of finality. Sure, court decisions can be overturned. Sure, the legislature might come along and change the law. But for those people in that case, <coughs> the court decision is normally final. It's in fact almost always final. Uh, once you've gone through the appellate process, you're stuck. Montesquieu um, famously thought that the courts were one of the most dangerous branches of government. Not the weakest and least dangerous, but one of the most dangerous because the judge has almost absolute power over the parties in front of him or her. Um, this, I think, suggests perhaps why we worry about dissenting courts. Because once you have dissenting courts, we peek behind the curtain. We see the little people with their, 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 their organs and their whatevers. 
producing the music. Um, we get a sense that the outcome of that case might have depended on which judge was sitting on the bench. Um, and once people realise that, once people appreciate that, and realise that the, the decision might have gone either way, then they might well say, well, why should that decision be final in my case if it could have gone uh, the other way if there had been a different um, bench? Um, okay, so why do people accept the rulings of the courts? Um, and I think there are two arguments. There's the real and difficult one, and there's the fairy tale fantasy uh, uh, one, the popular uh, one. The real and difficult one turns on the need for finality in disputes, that we have to have some way of closing them. We have to have some way of stopping these disputes from continuing. Um, in addition, the value, and this is what Alison has written on at a uh, great length, the value of an institution that can focus on particular cases, on the case-by-case -case method, and can uh, 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 modify and adapt the law in response to the demands raised by particular cases. So I think there are good moral arguments as to why we have courts and why courts have finality and why we should accept courts, why, why we should allow, accept the decision of courts should stand. But this genuine argument, I think, isn't the argument that sways most people most of the time in the country. Outside these doors in the real world, the, 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 those who aren't experienced in, in how law actually operates, you know, ordinary people, professors of private law, um, <laughs> tend to adopt a very different understanding of why uh, our law should find the fairy tale. That the judge is gifted with a magic word that oh, um, reveals the legal truth uh, uh, to him or her, and that there is some way of neutrally ascertaining what uh, uh, the law is. Um, that the, the, the judges don't change the law, they just um, declare it. Well, we all know, of course, that that's not true. That the, 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 the judges' uh, uh, normative beliefs affect how they interpret the law, affect how they develop the law uh, perfectly legitimately. But that, as it were, the hard argument I talked about a moment ago um, 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 is much less um, attractive and much harder to, to appreciate than the fairy tale. So we should, be care we should be cautious, I think, about the extent to which we uh, 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 dispel the fairy tale. We should be cautious at the extent to which we uh, 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 um, reduce fairy tale. How can the fairy tale be damaged? Well, I've got three, um, three ways, um, all of which arose out of the discussion we had this morning. And I'm not taking any position on Poland because I don't know, but I think three ways in which it can occur are, first, there's what I've written here, the risk of overexcited judges. Uh, and I've put the danger of Dworkinianism, as, as if that's a terrible blight that might descend in it. Um, I think there is um, um, a risk that uh, judges that haven't yet got the sort of social capital that allows them to um, develop the law seek to do so in uh, radical and surprising ways and people look at the judges and say, well, hold on, that doesn't seem to be to us what we thought the Constitution said. I remember, was it, it was Dworkin, wasn't it, who said that um, capital punishment isn't constitutional in America. Now, if the Supreme Court came out and said that, um, I think the American people would be understandably surprised to discover that, even though I'm absolutely against capital punishment and I think it, it, it shouldn't be law in America. So maybe this is a question I'd like to hear an answer by um, those of you with experience in the Polish Constitution. Was it the case that the Polish Constitutional Court was, uh, 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 um, let's put it this way, uh, um, ambitious in its early decisions? Was, are there any, did, did, did the Polish Constitution Court fail to build that relationship with people that could have sustained it through this crisis? I'm, I don't know, but I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. My second vice is overly candid judges. I, 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 in the United Kingdom, we used to have a rule that said that judges should be uh, seen and not heard when out of court. They weren't allowed to say anything. And this was in part to maintain the fiction. It's, it's a good thing that judges try to avoid giving the impression that they have political um, um, affiliations or party political um, beliefs. Now, judges are human too, I think. Um, so, of course, they do have political beliefs. But keep it beneath the surface. Keep it beneath. In the United States of America, of course, the Supreme Court judges have um, political affiliations. But they tend to go out of their way to avoid expressing it in nakedly political language. Better still, if the judges can um, 
avoid party political identification, I think. In the United Kingdom, for sure, our judges have normative beliefs that shape their judgments, but they're quite careful to avoid making it clear which party they're tied to. My third vice is the vice of overly critical legislatures. Now, given that judges are constitutional actors, given that they are making normative decisions, given that there can be political consequences to this, um, it's inevitably the case that legislatures will, from time to time, want to debate what judges have done. But be warned, legislators, be warned. Don't forget the importance of the integrative function of the courts in ending disputes. Don't forget the danger of challenging people's belief and, and their support in the courts. So uh, uh, legislators, I would suggest, should normally set an example, should hold back. Now, this is my final, final point. What happens when the integrative function of a constitution fails? when it starts to stop uh, uh, resolving disagreement. Bruce Ackerman, we heard from this morning, I heard about this morning, identified two uh, modes of constitutional activity. One, the exciting mode of constitutional creation, where all things are on the table. The other, the everyday mode of politics, where things continue with the, the constitution to be unchallenged. I think this is far too simplistic a divide that Ackerman is presenting us with. But he's certainly right in saying that from time to time there comes a point in the life of the state where the old constitutional certainties have to be re-evaluated and um, 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 reassessed. In that case, you're in a stormy hour. In that case, um, it isn't true, it is not uh, 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 the case that that integrative role disappears. We now need to think about the integrative function of the constitution during its, its, its recreation, during its reanimation. Re um, during periods of constitutional change, if you want to keep your state intact, you need to find new ways of bringing people together behind the emerging constitutional um, order. And this means, I think, during periods of profound constitutional change, it's singularly unwise to play winner-takes-all politics. In ordinary political life, you get a majority, you go through the legislature, ha, yeah, you win. And that's okay because, you know, next time around somebody else can come in and change it. But during periods of profound constitutional change, um, it's very important to try and reach agreements that minorities can agree to as well as minorities that have a stability, that have a broad range of support. And sometimes, if that means that a majority has to, 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 to compromise, well, that's, that's, that, that, I would advise the majority to do that in order to preserve the broader integrative function of the state and to preserve effect and to create effective constitutional institutions that will work uh, thereafter. Well, I didn't think I was going to say very much, but I seem to go on for quite some time, but I, 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 will, I will stop there. Thank you. Richard. Well, thank you, Nikolai, for chairing and for, for organising today. And thank you to everyone who spoke earlier in the day. Uh, they were um, fascinating papers, presentations, and I, I learned a great deal. Uh, I feel like I've learned a great deal about Polish law and politics, but not nearly enough to be an informed um, commentator, uh, nonetheless. So the remarks I make um, are long lines of next caveat will be uh, general reflections on, on constitutional law with um, some reference maybe to the Anglo-American experience uh, with a focus on what constitutions do, on the risk of usurpation perhaps, and on how one might try to answer that risk or perceived risk in ways that are uh, as minimally damaging to the rule of law as, as can be perhaps. So just to begin with, um, what are constitutions for? Well, uh, a few things, but at, at base I think they are uh, the way in which we make provision for our, our um, reasoned self-government. So the way in which citizens will rule themselves, secure their common good over time. And the rule of law is central to the exercise, it's part of the, uh, the common good that one aims to realise, forms part of the framework in which the, uh, the activity is undertaken. And constitutions will make this provision, um, when they do, or make the provision better or worse, They'll make it by setting up uh, institutions of various kinds, representative institutions, uh, non-representative but um, critical institutions such as courts, if they're represented, they're represented in a very special kind of way. Uh, introducing legal rules and non-legal rules that structure how those institutions proceed and the relation between them. And then bedding down these arrangements in a, a supportive culture. And the role that law plays in constitutional order is clearly going to vary from, uh, from place to place and time to time. And the role that judges play in the constitutional order will vary uh, to some extent as well. So if one thinks about the United Kingdom, there's quite clearly a large part of the constitutional order in this, uh, in this polity that is not 
um, the province of the courts. That's not, uh, in which one wouldn't say that the court is the decisive agent, or maybe even centrally an agent at all. And even in the United States, which plainly uh, constitutional law is um, of a somewhat different character to in the United Kingdom, there are constitutional conventions as well, and even some, um, some legal questions are clearly deemed to not be um, subject to authority of adjudication of the courts, so-called political question doctrine. And it might be worth noting, um, I think, a general point, which you see in the Minister of Law to some extent, and in constitutional law as well, that the question about what the constitution or the, the relevant uh, legal proposition, the question about what it means, what its legal standing should be, is not the same as the question of whose decision about meaning uh, is to be decisive. It's not the same as the question of who should enforce the rule in question. Uh, they may often go together, and the idea of law certainly has a, um, a straightforward connection to the, the court having the decisive um, uh, role to play in the adjudication of um, disputes about the meaning of law. But one can uh, make legal provision for different arrangements, or even uh, non-legal constitutional provision for a separation between those two questions. I think you see that in the United States with the so-called political questions doctrine. Uh, so one's making provision by way of a constitution for a certain kind of um, self-government in which the rule of law at least has a role to play but is also uh, one of the, uh, the objects that one's trying to introduce and then maintain. So there are important questions of constitutional design to be, uh, to be undertaken. But whatever um, design one undertakes, there's then a, a risk of usurpation, which we'll say a, a bit about in a moment. I just want to, um, so Nick touched on this, but I think, it's a, I think it is a mistake to think that the legislative power is just necessarily the most dangerous power, or necessarily more dangerous than the judicial power. Like if you forced me to say which of the powers was most dangerous, I'd say the executive, the one with the capacity to, uh, to act and to, um, uh, to hurt people in, in, in very immediate ways. But I'd, I'd like to resist the question in one way, because all the powers are dangerous, and they're all indispensable. And the question is how to control for the dangers, and how to set up, uh, and, and not to overreact to the possible dangers, how to institute these, um, this institutional arrangement in a way that allows a, a productive uh, sort of interaction. And there are particular pathologies, one could say, that afflict the legislature, that afflict the judiciary. In relation to the judiciary, the risk of excessive empowerment, of course, so... Uh, choosing to confer excessive power on either the courts at large or a, a Supreme Court, a constitutional court. There is a risk you will alienate citizens from self-government. There's a risk you'll get a certain kind of self-serving rule, where the interests of the, the class in which lawyers are represented looms too large. There's a risk you'll just get incompetent government, where the institutional capacity of the court is uh, not apt for the decisions that need to be made. And there's a risk also, I think, you'll get the politicisation of legal processes, where the pull of arguments are not going to go away are mediated through, um, through the courts through arguments about the proper role of the court or the performance of particular judges. There's, there's that design question, as I say, what powers to confer on courts, where one should bear in mind these, um, these possible risks. But then, in addition, there's the usurpation worry, which is you set up, whatever structure you set up uh, can be subverted, can be, um, can be set aside, can be overtaken. Uh, and how should one adjust it, how shall one compensate for it? Well, watching out for it is obviously uh, an important point. Um, and then being ready to criticise it, to, to resist it. In resisting um, the, the usurpation of constitutional office, of, uh, of legal authority, one has to take pains, I think, to minimise the damage that, that one's response is going to do to the constitutional order at large. And the rule of law is... Um, complicated idea, and it's going to cut in two directions here. It might sometimes justify extraordinary action, uh, but it's very often going to require simply sticking with the existing uh, legal arrangements and being very careful to, uh, to license extraordinary action. So there's a strong, at a minimum, a strong um, disposition, a strong preference, presumption in favour of uh, pursuing lawful means, pursuing the existing um, constitutional legal structures in order to to combat what may be um, perceived as a usurpation. I think if one looks worldwide, um, in my comparative knowledge is somewhat limited, but at least in, in um, common law jurisdictions, you see some of these, these um, techniques. Ways of trying to use legal technique to answer uh, the misuse of judicial power. And I include here within misuse um, not just sort of clear excess of authority, but what's perceived to be a problematic uh, judicial philosophy. Uh, so, See this in glaring fashion in the United States, of course, where 
half the country thinks there's one uh, right way of approaching the materials, and the other half thinks there's, a, there's another way. Uh, how does one deal with this? Well, arguing about who is appointed to the court is a straightforwardly routine um, mode in which this plays out. Modification of decision rules is a less common but uh, also raised um, mode of, of response. It's the more radical proposal of stripping the jurisdiction of the court, limiting it. One sees that in the United States as well. Uh, sometimes the capacity for legislative reversal, well, obviously that's often conditioned and limited by the Constitution. Different places make provision for this. Uh, and then, and maybe this, is, um, maybe this should come first, but maybe it also comes last because it's so hard, outright constitutional amendment and change. And that, always won't, that won't always do the job, rather, because uh, if it falls to the same court to determine the significance and effect of that amendment, then the change may, may be inadequate. Or it may be hard to, to frame a change with the precision that's, um, that's necessary. Well, I want to say just a word or two um, uh, before turning over to Alison about the way in which this, this set of questions has taken place in the, the UK and the United States. The United Kingdom, as has been remarked, um, is uh, a system that has parliamentary legislative supremacy, also has the rule of law, which the courts have a, uh, a robust and important role to play in constitutional argument, but a secondary one in the sense that they're always subject to reversal. So their judicial independence is secure. I think it would be um, extremely, it is extremely hard for good reason to remove any judge from office, but their judgments are sometimes trenchantly criticised, sometimes reversed, and even, well, this is rare, sometimes reversed with effect for that particular case. The arguments we have about judicial independence are much less severe than those that uh, are going on in Poland, plainly. That might be in part uh, because our judges are relatively weaker, as in less turns on, on the particular judgment of the court. Uh, even in the Miller judgment, the recourse the effect of the Miller judgment was to require the Parliament to make a certain decision. Uh, and so that safety, there's a safety valve of a certain kind, I think. If one looks back in, in um, British and especially English constitutional history, one does see uh, unlawful constitutional change. One sees outright usurpation, even, uh, of, of um, one king of another king, the parliament as opposed to the, the lawful king, uh, which, as one sees, um, in the Glorious Revolution back in, in 1689. There have been um, suggestions in the academic literature picked up from time to time in um, judgments, well, usually in the minority and uh, certainly in, in obiter remarks, that the courts might uh, overturn the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. And uh, some other judges have criticised this trenchantly. If that rhetoric were followed through, uh, there would be a constitutional crisis here in the United Kingdom. I don't think it's a constitutional crisis that would lack resolution, however, because I think you would see a decisive response from Parliament and the government with widespread public support. Now, the government and political authorities might just ignore the judgment. I rather doubt it. I think this is good, this is good news. Uh, they might um, fail to recognise the legitimacy of the judgment. Certainly not remotely a stand, in fact, otherwise it doesn't happen. But here, one would have an abandonment of constitutional law and principle that might warrant uh, a, a failure to, um, to recognise this as a lawful judgment. One might have that, but one would also, I think, necessarily have a legislative response. So for the avoidance of doubt, the decision of such and such is, uh, is, not, uh, has, is of no effect. And maybe relatively, steps taken to remove the relevant judges. It's very hard, but possible. I'll shift, um, I think, to, to the United States um, quickly, if I may. Uh, American lawyers, as many of you do, maybe most of you all know, are enthusiasts in one way for judicial supremacy, but also conflicted about this, and long had qualms. Uh, and the widespread political argument you see in American legal discourse and in political discourse about the best way to interpret the Constitution uh, shows this, um, this in part. It's an argument about the proper role of the court and which, whose uh, preferences should be informing the court's, process, the court's um, operations. And that's played out through the appointments process, but from time to time it has a, a more radical edge even than that. Suggestions of packing the court with extra judges. Uh, suggestions of um, uh, stripping the jurisdiction of the court. And the threat of this is very often um, enough, and one saw that threat very clearly and arguably effectively with um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, back in the 30s to protect the New Deal from, um, from judicial assault. One saw suggestions, or more, more muted, on the part of Barack Obama in and in, in, in around the time of the healthcare litigation. So there's a sort of political dynamic to the operation of the court 
uh, partly, I think, because of the straightforward political process the court has undertaken. The theory of um, departmentalism, as some of you will, will know of, uh, has a sort of recurring life in, in American thought, that the court's uh, capacity to decide what the meaning of the Constitution is is limited um, to particular, uh, particular domains, li limited to their adjudications, not uh, doesn't have a more um, widespread application. Now, as an um, uh, English uh, New Zealand lawyer, I find this uh, quite a strange idea, uh, that one had, would have that, that limitation. But it does look as though it's a way of trying to hold on to, trying to square in a way, having uh, a, an important constitutional law, uh, supreme constitutional law, with the kind of political dynamic that is at work in arguing about how, how, how to be governed. A way of minimising and muting the impact that litigation and court process would make on, on democratic argument. There's a widespread argument, or a long-running argument, rather, uh, as, as you'll know, that the original shape of the Constitution, the United States Constitution, is uh, unfit for purpose, that it's overly, overly restrictive. And the progressive movement has argued for a, a great expansion in the capacities of the federal government. And that's a line of argument I'm um, quite sympathetic to, that the, the original shape is simply out of kilter with what is um, what's required, given the change in social and economic conditions. So there's much to be said for that argument, I think. Uh, of course, there's a problem that the argument often wants not just to loosen strictures on democratic bodies, but also to simply modify, update, replace old strictures with new strictures on a, a revolving basis. Uh, and it's unsurprising, I think, that both there's something to be said for this, and that it has encouraged, has given rise to a pretty fierce conservative, legal conservative reaction, the, uh, the self-proclaimed um, originalist movement that takes a lot of uh, comfort and, and stress from uh, the, the rhetoric of the rule of law, uh, resisting uh, an attempt to loosen constitutional structures, uh, trying to, to restate them. So, and that political argument playing out looks inevitable, given, um, given the, the sort of, I think, oversized, from my perspective, role that constitutional law of this uh, um, supreme, um, supreme law standing plays uh, in American public discourse. So, just to bring this to a, um, a conclusion, the use of legal means to limit the jurisdiction of the courts, I don't think it isn't going to be necessarily disreputable. The scope of judicial authority is a political question, but it's a political question to be addressed insofar as one can by way of the existing legal and constitutional forms, and one that has to be addressed with the value of the rule of law in mind. Uh, so, when undertaking this sort of reform exercise, if one perceives it that way, Holding in mind the disposition to uphold and rebuild the rule of law looks, looks pretty significant. So a strong reason to avoid recourse to extraordinary action. Uh, and to realize even if you undertake it and you win, you still have to rebuild afterwards uh, with presumably the same people you had um, when you set out. So I'll stop there. works and the issues that have been arisen for it. I also like to thank uh, Nick and Richard for um, inviting me on, on the auspices of the programme which they, they jointly organised and also for introducing us with such great themes. Uh, there are three things that I would like to focus on, uh, but before I do so I'd like to give you a little anecdote uh, just because I'm the last speaker so I have the disadvantage of you all being asleep by now so I'm hoping to try and work you up a little. Uh, and the, the purpose of this anecdote is to encourage you afterwards to visit Blackwell's Coffee Shop. Uh, if you're wondering why you should visit Blackwell's Coffee Shop, that's because nearly 15 years ago, Nick Barber and I were writing an article together on Henry VIII clauses, and somehow between us came up with the phrase constitutional self-defence mechanism. I'm not really sure who came up with it first or how this emerged, but I do remember us talking about this in that very coffee shop. So as this has been one of the themes of the conference, may I encourage you at some stage to, to visit the birthplace of the term constitutional self-defense there, 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 There's a plaque, actually. There is a plaque there, yes, a blue plaque. <laughs> here, here was forged the phrase constitutional self-defense mechanism. Um, the reason I'm giving you this anecdote is because despite 
having that common origin, I think um, Nick Barber's work has pushed very helpfully in one direction by looking at what that might mean, and mine has perhaps moved in a different direction, and that's going to help form the three points that I want to make, which again are drawn from my reflections on hearing this morning as an outsider. So I have no ability or expertise to resolve this debate. I found it fascinating. And these comments are a reflection of what it's made me think about in terms of constitutionalism as a whole. And that's how these comments are intended. And because I'm from the UK and we're in a general election moment at the moment, uh, where Theresa May seems to think that alliteration is the way forward. Uh, my first two points are the, uh, um, are the danger of dichotomies. Uh, the second point is the horror of homogenization. There we go. And I couldn't work anything out for the third one, so you just got a reflection on liberal democracies more generally. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, let out on liberal democracy. I don't know if that's as much as all. Or letting, letting myself down with liberal democracies. So maybe that's where we're going. What do I mean by the danger of dichotomies? One theme I picked up on from reflecting on these really interesting and fascinating papers and listening to the discussion this morning is within two of the papers, um, there is a, a kind of reflection take stepping back and looking at it through a perspective of this dichotomy between legal and political constitutionalism. As if somehow these are very separate schools of thought and that you have a choice. Your choice is you are either going to go down the idea of legal constitutionalism or you're going to go down the idea of political constitutionalism. If you're going to go down the path of legal constitutionalism, then you're going to go down the path of having uh, legal authorities, authorities ultimately having the final say. If you go down the path of political constitutionalism, then you're going down the path of political authorities having the final say. Well, the reason that I think this is dangerous is because part of my research from reflecting on constitutional self-defense mechanisms was to push me towards looking at another D word, dialogue. And the reason I was looking at this from the viewpoint of these dichotomies is we're often told that somehow the model of dialogue is between the two. So we don't have these two dichotomies and nothing between them. We have this wonderful middle path we can take. Um, the more I looked at this possibility, the more I realised that these dichotomies are not two choices. They're values that push in different directions, and you go away and find me a model of pure legal constitutionalism or pure political constitutionalism. Because in constitutional structures with legal constitutionalism, you will find that there are mechanisms we refer to them things like judicial minimalism or reflection on the judicial role, which takes account of political decision making, which might carve out political questions or might say these issues are more suited to political issues. So there are mechanisms of recognising the value of political decision making in exactly the same way that if you go down the line of political constitutionalism, there are legal decisions that are still made. There are legal courts that are still there, and there's a reflection on the value of legal decision making. What you find are within different constitutions, you have different institutions with different powers. And sometimes these different powers are there because it's a reflection on that institutional structure. So Nick very kindly mentioned earlier uh, the work that some of the work I've been doing, looking at different values and different reasoning of courts and legislatures, and how courts for example, can look at particular decisions, whereas legislatures might make more general amalgamations, or make general policy choices. Courts can go away and look at an individual situation and say, well, I can see the general aim you want to get here, but in this individual application, it doesn't work. It's not working. I mention this because this is an institutional difference. They can reason in different ways because of their institutional structures. But there are also just constitutional choices you have different constitutions have made to give different constitutional powers. So Nick mentioned early courts and the normal role of finality. We made an institutional choice to give either the court or the legislature finality in particular decisions because you need those finality in certain instances. So there's a need for each institution to recognise those constitutional settlements those constitutional choices. We have a word for it, we call it committee. 
It's institutional respect. And you need that element of respect in the system, as well as a reflection on different institutional competences. And this is true of every single constitution you will come across. Where we get tensions and problems is when you're dealing with situations where you're, maybe there isn't a reflection on thinking about how institutions work together. Instead, there's a reflection of pushing it down dichotomies, or where there isn't necessarily a recognition of those different constitutional choices. And those constitutional choices are hard choices that different constitutions make. But if the constitution is going to work to perform its function, it needs all institutions to have an element of respect in how that works. And I'd like to recommend thinking about inter-institutional interactions that don't just focus on conflict, but focus on how you can use your different institutional strengths to work together. I think every constitution needs to draw on those as well. The second theme I wanted to look at, my other attempt, terrible attempt at alliteration to stop you falling asleep, um, is the horror of homogenization. Sounds great, doesn't it? So you'll remember that if nothing else. What do I mean by that? I think, again, a theme that has been coming through this is a recognition that a liberal constitutional mechanism cannot be applied in a one-size-fits-all way. You can't just take a particular constitutional model, a particular constitutional structure, put it on a particular culture, and then say, off you go, do exactly as we do. Of course you can't. And you've rightly pointed out some of the problems that there is, and there are problems in certain institutions. So we see them not just in Poland, but a lot of the issues that's been coming across in the UK at the moment has been a feeling again, that some of the rulings from the European Union, some of the rulings from the European Court of Human Rights perhaps go too far and don't recognise cultural differences. So I understand the problems of trying to impose a particular constitutional in a homogenised way. But there's another element of homogenisation that can be just as problematic. And we can see that when we see not just this idea of one model fits all, but I think also you can see it in other constitutions. And this is this idea that there is one people, and this one people has one voice. People have lots of voices. Just in the same way that there are different plural cultures within the European Union, and we need to respect them within those particular countries, different, there are different aspects of the population with different voices. So just to give you a wonderful example, you meet me here, I'm a member of the Oxford Elite. Okay, so I'm one of the elites. If I go home and talk with a native accent, I'm not, I'm all at working classes. Okay? People have different elements within them. There is no such homogenised people. And constitutions need to reflect pluralities of views within their system, as well as um, supranational and international institutions respecting pluralities of views between the different countries that they are regulating. Now, I wish I had a wonderful solution, and this brings me to my third point. In a sense, that's what the phrase liberal democracy is all about. It's about recognising that often these two elements stand in tension. That the liberal principles that you want to enforce in a particular society may not necessarily fully reflect what the people want. That's what constitutional structures are there for, as Nick was pointing out. It's about recognising there is these tensions are always going to be there. Constitutional structures are there to help alleviate these tensions. Not to say they're going to go away, but that they're a way of recognising and putting these tensions through different institutional structures so they can work together against one another to build up different principles and within your structures it's a way of resolving it in a way that those who are part of that constitutional structure accept. That doesn't mean to say you can't change your constitution and that doesn't mean to say there aren't going to be moments that push towards a need to change those constitutions. But constitutions are there to recognise that tension and to deal with it. Now I'd love to be able to tell you there is a wonderful answer to how you deal with these tensions. But I think the only thing I can say, drawing on my experience of the UK constitution, is there is no answer. But often, particularly in the UK, somehow we make it work out. 
we're not really quite sure how sometimes. <coughs> and I'm not, I couldn't give you our institutions as an idea of perfection. In fact, they probably tend to run a mile and to stay well away. But somehow they work. And I think a lot of the element of what makes it work is the recognition of what those structures and what that combination of legal and political rules are there for. And that takes us back to the next I think there are mechanisms of trying to facilitate that tension and resolve it in a legitimate manner. Thank you very much. Can you invite all the uh, contributors to sit here? And then we'll take questions. There's no break now, just we'll, we'll go straight to questions. many chairs. <laughs> okay. Playing musical chairs now. Uh, yes, so, so, so uh, the way we'll, we'll go about this is to have uh, um, an opportunity for all, uh, for all the panelists uh, to have a short response up to five minutes, please. Uh, um, in, well, in the order as, as you said, if that's fine. And then we'll take questions in groups of three, and then we'll, we'll have a, another round of answers. So, uh, Professor Stavinsky. Thank you. So, uh, I'm very much impressed that uh, by the, the dead watch, watch what the, the party said, and I would like to make uh, just two or three comments. Uh, I generally agree with all that what has been said, but just want to apply that to our situation in Poland. First, the presentation by Professor Barber. Uh, he stressed the integrative function of the, of, of the Constitution, then that the, it has uh, as, as, uh, two, two shapes, ending disagreement and uh, disagreements and accepting outcome of the disagreement, not withstanding that I as to the substance, do not agree with the, with the, uh, the, with the outcome. I think that, that is extremely important. I think there's a very essence of, of democracy, that I accept something even if I lose. But there's a question what requirements must be met in order to trigger such, such acceptance by me. Uh, I think that the most important requirements are purely procedural. So, uh, as far as judicial decisions are concerned, I'm able to uh, accept the decision even if I lose, provided that the proceedings were fair. So, each party had the right to speak, all arguments were carefully considered by the court. So, even if I lose, then say, that's okay, I, 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 I'm going to follow this decision. As far as other decisions are concerned, for example, outcome of parliamentary elections. So I accept the outcome, even if I lose, provided that the procedure was fair, and provided that I have full certainty there will be next elections in four years, and my party will have opportunity to win. I'm afraid I don't have full certainty as to this point right now. So I think that we must put stress on the procedure. Uh, you will be surprised, but I'm not very enthusiastic about judicial review. Uh, I tend to agree with Jeremy Waldron, who is one of the main opponents of the judicial review, at least in the strong form. But Waldron says, we don't need judicial review, provided that certain conditions are satisfied. And the most important of those conditions, to my mind, is the condition of, of uh, uh, how to, how, uh, commitment to rights. And I think that such commitment to rights is absent in my country. That is so that people are, are going to assert their own rights. I have freedom of speech, I can say whatever I want to do, want to say. But they are not ready to accept the same right of the other party. So they say, no, you, you do not have to write, uh, the right to say that because that is wrong. So as long as there is no commitment to rights, 
So then I think the judicial review, review is necessary. To my mind, the Constitution is not for the majority. Majority can rule without having any constitu Constitution. Majority may enforce any decision. Consti constitution is, is written for minorities. The main role of the Constitution is to, is to protect, pro protect uh, minorities. So uh, I also agree with Professor Young that uh, with the stress on plurality. Uh, so. Uh, each society is plural. There are very few really homogenic societies. There is plurality of views, there is plurality of political opinions, of modes of life, and so on and so on. And each minority deserves protection. So without effective constitutional system, such protection is impossible. So that's all what I would want to say. I uh, realized that that was quite trivial, banal, and obvious, but it really expresses what what what, what I feel. Professor Marcinaccio. Thank you very much. No, I, I believe that the problem with this kind of symposia is that uh, you know there is there are some there's some state of affairs. People do not have uh, do not know everything, and there are a lot of ideas, and we, that perhaps are not easily applicable to the state of affairs. It's difficult to translate Polish problems into the international language. So I think I will use this the, the five minutes to try to translate it using the help of great philosophers and lawyers. And the first one will be Jürgen Habermas. Uh, we heard a lot about the dialogue and about the exchange of views and how it is important for the for the societies. You know, I wrote a short article in the Polish uh, newspaper uh, called the end of the conversation, yeah. the end of the dialogue. And why is it so? As you remember, Habermas came up with the idea of the ideal speech situation. The situation in which there are some parties that discuss, uh, Professor Studinsky mentioned some of the requirements for this discussion to, 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 take, to take, take place. The problem is that I think we had an ideal speech situation. It is an ideal speech situation, so it's, it's, it's an ideal, but we had something that was close to that in 1997, when we simply met together as a society and we enacted a, a new constitution. Why was it acceptable from the Habermasian point of view? Because there was a dialogue before, uh, everyone was, um, uh, could, could, could say, uh, express their opinions, and so on and so on. We did not have, during the communism, this kind of uh, comfort to, to have this kind of discussion. Nevertheless, the current majority in Poland uh, negates that that was a moment, that was a constitutional moment, and that, that was the ideal speech situation. Why? Because uh, we did not reveal all the bad things people did during the communism, so-called illustration, the re revealing of what people did, was a lie. It was the basis of this compromise, and therefore this constitution has no legitimacy. And the current government, not having the supermajority for the constitutional amendment, is trying to negate our speech situation, our, our agreement from the 1997, and to propose something more. I don't agree with that, and I think Habermas would not approve that, because there are procedures for that. The party can change the constitution if the party has a supermajority to do so. Law and justice does not have this supermajority. I would accept the change of the constitution, but they have to have the supermajority. Why? Because it means that the majority of the society gave them this right. We didn't give them this right during the last election, so they cannot negate the you, institutional Speech Act from 1997, in which we said what is important for us. Let's wait till the next election. Perhaps the law and justice will win and they will have the supermajority. That's okay. I can accept this because the procedure is followed. At the moment, it is not followed. So, to summarize Habermas here, there was an ideal speech situation close to ideal in 1997. The current government uh, criticizes this, says it, they say it was not. Uh, uh, they don't have supermajority, but they pretend they are having it, and they want to impose on the society their vision of the of the of the 
uh, of, of, the, of the values and of the constitutional order. <coughs> the end of compensation, why? Because in the ideal speech situation we have two partners, for example, legislature and judiciary. At the moment we have two chairs on the public stage, but each, st each, each chair on each chair sits the same person, in fact. This is the governing majority. We don't have any compensation because there is a statement by the... So the statement by the government and the statement by the Constitutional Tribunal are the same statements. Yeah, so, and that's, that's a big problem, no com conversation. Then the second great lawyer is Bruce Ackerman, again. Uh, I think that, uh, again, the Polish party, governing party, the law and justice, they say that we have a constitutional moment now in, 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 in Poland. Uh, I don't see any reasons we should have it. Of course, we should think about our constitution, we should analyze it, we should perhaps update it, but again, there are procedures for doing so. If we have a government uh, saying, please believe me, with this regular elections, the constitutional moment came, I don't believe that because I don't, I, again, I want to see the supermajority, the majority of the society <coughs> saying, yes, that's the moment to do so. Last election, the support for the law and justice was not a supermajority, so there is no constitutional moment. So they have to carry out the regular politics still within the constitutional politics that we agreed upon in 1997. And finally, HLA Hart. Uh, we heard a lot about the relationship between judiciary and legislature. I think there was some reason Hart said that the rule of recognition is a practice of judiciary and not legislature. These are judges who are responsible for recognizing the rules as legal rules and more importantly to make a system out of those rules. Uh, and I agree also with Mikoy, or disagree with Mikoy Barchantevich that the judiciary, sorry, legislature cannot change the rule of recognition. What we are having in Poland at the moment is an attempt by the legislature to change the rule of recognition. So they want to influence the way judges recognize rules, recognize values, etc. So the legislature, by court pack, by packing the court, by by by, in, but. But, but the ch by the chilling effect, by attacking judges, they want to force them to recognize the rules that are uh, in line with the, with the law and justice idea and the law and justice work, and not to accept others. I think that's not possible. This is the role of judges, to recognize the rules, to create a system out of them, and if you if you allow the, the legislature to do so, you turn the world on, on, on head. It, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work. This is the separation of powers. This is why we call it a separation of powers, separation of tasks. I hope that Habermas, Ackermann, and Hart helped you to understand what is happening in Poland at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. President. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you to all the speakers before me. It seems to me that you touched this all those the problem of the constructive theory. And I don't want to go to the Polish details, fortunately. So I will use my <coughs> Australian connection, as you could recognize my Aussie strong accent <laughs> signals that I am from the down under. Anyway, a few years ago, one of my colleagues from the Netherlands came to, to Sydney. And what he put my he put my attention to the one problem. He said, there are everywhere rules in Sydney. There are rules how to use park, rules how to use toilets. And his explanation was Obviously, the convict society or post convict society. But I thought about it. And I disagree with the post convict society, but it's a society in which 40% of the population was born overseas. Which means you've got a multicultural society, and now the question is how to put these people together, basically. And how to put them together by setting up some norms and institutions. But what is happening there is a sort of the social capital, huge social capital for this institution. What was mentioned, <coughs> mentioned here by the first speaker is the social capital of the judges. In the, not only in Poland, but in all those post former post communist countries, the social capital of the institution is very, very low. Which means, is that from the very start, from the very beginning, there is a huge problem. Then the second, it seems to me, I, that's that what we witness, also not only in Poland, but in other countries as well, is a, is a problem which, why this? Constitutional politics, not a normal politics, as we mentioned earlier in this Ackermannian <coughs> typology. It seems to me that the constitutive body was not clearly 
establish, which means still the architectonic movement. There is a sort of the tension going on. What, what are the characteristics of constituted body and constituted body? It means both of them. It's not clear everywhere. And <clears throat> outcome of that is a very serious crisis, crisis which will go as long as this issue is not going to be solved. And then I want to also use some such distinction, and there are two different ways of the relation between the constitution and the, and the social element. One, let's call it Slovenia. Well, why Slovenia? Slovenia is a small country, very nice one. And uh, oh, it's very nice, you know, wine as well. But what is there? The constitution didn't change, but the constitution has been hijacked by the network of vested interests. Which means that the constitution was pushed to realize the interest of the only few, no, of a part of the society. Then is the second option of relation between the constitution and the, and the social element or political element is the Orbanian one, it means Orban from Hungary. Right? What is there? Well, one party, one political party, conquer, hijack the constitution of the state, change it according to its own interest. What we witness in Poland, it seems to me, we are in the middle of the road. Somewhere between the Orbanian element, it means to change the, the text of the constitution, operation of the constitution, and the second element is this, what for is this action? It seems to me this action is only to recover this type state which is partly <clears throat> under the web of that network of interest. Am I right or wrong? Well, it seems to me that we could, we could discuss. But the question which I ask is, that what is the role of the, of the institutional self-defense mechanism, which we're supposed to discuss here? Well, it's, it seems to me that to what degree all those discussions, all those, what I read about the institutional self-defense mechanism is only in relation to the relatively normal politics. But it don't work, probably, in the process of transformation, rapid change, because there is a process of the creation of the institution, which means everybody is pushing, finding the space, not only de defending. So therefore, well, after some time, there will be stabilization of the constitutional situation there, <coughs> and we could, we could probably find out the, the or to discuss, basically, the self-defense self mechanism. And the, Last but not least, I think the last speaker mentioned about this danger of dichotomies. Well, it's true that they are extremely dangerous, these dichotomies, but at the same time, they are very helpful analytically. So it means from the normative point of view, yeah, I could totally agree. But on the other hand, if we don't adopt some sort of the models and the ideal types in the Bavarian sense to analyze, and only it seems to me in such sense which here try to use these dichotomies to find out what is down, down there, it means in the, in the social structure behind the, the constitution and the cultural structure. Thank you very much. President Lechmarz. So, I would like to, uh, of course, I, I, I cannot agree, uh, agree with Professor uh, Studnitsky that constitution are written for the minorities. They are written both for minorities and for majorities. You remember the, the famous um, judgment on uh, 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 court in Strasbourg in Lautzi case. It's a vivid uh, example how one person living in a foreign country try to terrorize the whole society, society accustomed to certain practices with regard to religion. It is the problem, yes, it is really the problem. But not only, not only majoritarianism, majority can terrorize the minorities, but it is the worst when the minorities try to terrorize the majorities, yes. <coughs> so we should try to find certain balance, yes, certain balance. Of course, it's easy to say, try to find a balance. Yeah.
much difficult to find it. But with regard to the remarks of Professor Matschak, of course, as usual, I said, yes, you select the very, of course, uh, I agree, coming back to your comments, with uh, all the remarks referring to procedural justice, to like procedural justice, okay. But I think that uh, we try in the corridor about this uh, to speak that both of sides are guilty. Breaking of this rule of procedure. It was answer and attack and defense. It was not so. It was a game into which, uh, uh, in which one side of this conflict was like a virgin of a circle of a second one as a raper, a kind of raper is. It, it was not so. It was a rather a working set. But politics in our days resembles a bit contact sport. Yes? Between two boxers. Between two boxers. It is an exchange of attacks. But coming back again to Professor, you say mm -hmm. about the very interesting things referring to um, ideal speech situations and so on and so on. But why you don't mention the remarks of Habermas, who directly speaks about the colonization of, of cousin? It, uh, it referred to the relation between Europe and Africa. But he said that what is going now resembles the colonization of the East countries by the West countries. It resembles a kind of education as a less educated people, right? not, not worse to live in the uh, West society. We want to rearrange to a certain degree, to remember, like in Croatia, like in Poland, in Hungary, we have our, our own, our own uh, uh, constitutional um, identity history. I don't say that you know, our history, that our habits are always the, to the last, to the highest degree reasonable. We are ready to correct them, but not like in discussion, our discussion with colleagues with the West very, very often resemble me uh, the discussion, the debates between the master and the servants. Yeah. You are to hear, you are to recommend to you. We want to rearrange this model of contact between our two countries. Yes. But of course, I would like to thank you that I have, uh, I have a, the, the possibility to point out that the situation in Poland is far more complicated, far less univocal as it is presented by the European authorities and by the Polish authorities. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you to the panelists. And, and now I'll take three questions. Uh, Tomasz Wardyński, Martin Krieger, and uh, at the back. It is not really a question. I think that this is an observation. And again, I'm coming back to <coughs> this morning session. And I would like to say that uh, what we experience in Poland is not really <coughs> a Polish problem. Now, <coughs> it is a far more <coughs> universal problem of uh, I would say, social change and uh, touching cultural taboos. 
So, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, this is something what uh, brings to uh, a civic society a, a, a very essential sort of a conflict. Uh, <clears throat> and those who cannot really swallow what the social change is bringing, they are looking for the guilty ones. And are trying, I would say, to uh, restore the old order. And restoration of the old order obviously is possible very easy if you, <coughs> if you get to the abuse of law and abuse of the procedures. Now, <coughs> talking about, I would say, majority and minority, I would say that if you have to do with a society where only 40% of the electorate goes to the election, and gives a, a certain majority, even not absolute majority, in the <coughs> proportion to the whole of the society, then obviously <coughs> we have to agree that uh, a certain basis which the Constitution is, is there <coughs> to protect the minority, even though I would say minority, by I would say trying to abusing its own laws, can somehow terrorize majority, if at all possible. Now, <clears throat> what uh, uh, then uh, is there to do? Uh, obviously, we can go back to the procedures, but when we go back to the procedures, we cannot say that uh, uh, you may fight the abuse with the abuse. And uh, <coughs> with all due respect, uh, Professor Moraski, I think that <coughs> what you have uh, referred to at your previous speech this morning was that, uh, uh, okay, I would say they, Rzepnicki, who was abusing laws, therefore it is somehow making our abuse totally legitimate. Now, <coughs> no, no, that is, that is how I understood it. Although, I have to say that I do respect the views that, in a way, the old order is there to be protected. Because maybe, I would say, the <coughs> so-called political correctness is somehow leading the social development towards something which <coughs> may uh, not be acceptable to those who are, <coughs> I would say, moderately uh, respectful for the sense of aesthetics. Now, <clears throat> uh, but isn't it, uh, I would say, the case uh, that we are facing of counter-reformation? Uh, and if so, I would say, how many will be burned at stake? Uh, and when? Because, uh, you see, <clears throat> uh, the tribunal, constitutional tribunal, where you take part, have in fact accepted uh, a gradual sort of a drip change of legal system in other areas than the constitutional area. And this is <coughs> when it comes to the criminal procedure, whereas, I would say, criminal procedure became <coughs> to be dominated by a prosecutor, which was not even the case during the communist times. And when we look up, <coughs> I would say, the further changes to the law on the police, then <coughs> we will very quickly realize that we have certain body of measures built up which are ready to abuse law against the minority. So then, how do we then treat all this? And whether, I would say, fighting the changes which are touching cultural taboos is <coughs> somehow legitimizing the abuse. Thank you. Uh, Martin, Thanks. Two brief questions. One to Professor Machak. Uh, I agree with almost everything you said today, with one caveat or one question. And that is, you said that if uh, the 
Pierce or any other government had a supermajority, then whatever they decided you would accept as being procedurally warranted. One of the phenomena which is most striking and perhaps disturbing about modern, what is sometimes called illiberal democracies, is that is what has been called abusive constitutionalism. Abusive constitutionalism is the use of constitutional means for anti-constitutional purposes. It's not quite the same. It's categorically different from some a legislature which makes a decision about a social matter that I don't like. There you can understand that, okay, the procedures have to try out for at least have to rule again. If you believe that Orban, for example, who has the majority, may use as many measures to undermine the procedural guarantees in place, then I think you have a more complex problem. It's a common or an increasingly common problem, and I just like your comments. Brief or even briefer to Anna. Uh, you mentioned in reply to Professor Barber's notion of uh, institutional self defences that they're okay in luxury situations like the ones that you and I live in, uh, but not when the heat is on. But it's a very strange measure of defence which you say should get should stop working when there's an attack. Normally, you, you, keep, you, you try to focus on measures of defence when the attack is most uh, serious, and rather than when it's most gentle. And in many of these places, that's exactly what we see. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, I have a question summarising this interesting debate to Professor Blanchard, actually, as a, as a professor of legal philosophy. Um, because uh, when we make a few steps forward, let's say, to next election, because I believe that one day this constitutional crisis in Poland will end, finally. And uh, when we talk about the self-defense in the institutions, I have a question about the self-defense in an entire institutional state. Uh, if The question is, if from the moral from the ethic point of view, from the point of view of uh, legal philosophy, uh, is it acceptable to apply, because I'm, I'm asking about the restoration of the, the whole uh, judicial and constitutional system in Poland. Is it acceptable from the moral, <coughs> from the ethic point of view to apply, uh, let's say, special laws, which are not useful in a normal democracy, to make a restoration in the Polish constitutional system. Because uh, there are certain uh, discussions in our country right now, what to do after this constitutional crisis, how to make a restoration. Uh, who would like to respond? I think I have to. Professor <laughs> <laughs> Arsky, will, will you want to respond as well? So, so matching, matching. Uh, thank you very much. First question, I, I, I think that that was some kind of a mental shortcut. I said that I will accept everything that peace will decide. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but honestly, you know, uh, again, I think Habermas comes in handy here. Uh, the question is, okay, let's assume that the law and justice will get the supermajority in the next elections. The question is, was the discussion, the conversation in this world of the universal pragmatics, uh, I mean, carried out according to Habermasian requirements? I don't think so. One example, the law and justice hijacked the public media. They uh, shortened the uh, term of office of the Polish body, constitutional body, supervising the independence of the, of the, of the public media. There is a lot of propaganda in the public media. So, how the discussion on the next constitution will look like? I don't think it will be an ideal speech situation, according to Habermas. So what I wanted to say is that even if you have a supermajority, you still have to stick to the rules of the ideal speech situation. You have to treat others as partners. You have to give them the right to speak their minds. <coughs> Unfortunately, in Poland at the moment, with the public media hijack, with the Constitutional Tribunal paralyzed and hijacked, I don't see an ideal speech situation, simply. So, I would even dare to say that 
the Lord <coughs> Justice in this situation has no legitimacy to change the Constitution because no one who who, 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 who uh, has no respect towards the Constitution and no one who uh, disqualifies the Constitution that was enacted in the democratic process has the right or to, to, to for the democratic constitution. So, and now I, I, I switch to, to your questions. I think that we need first to, to return, I would say, somehow to a situation in which we can start a real discussion, a real conversation. And once again, we <coughs> cannot do this with the constitutional tribunal as it looks now. We cannot do this with the public media as they look now. So we need some tool to tidy up simply, to clean the whole, the whole, the whole problem. And I don't know. I don't know how to do this. I I would. So my dream would be that during the next election, the there will be a party or a coalition of parties that will get the supermajority, and that this party or this coalition will not change the constitution, but will enact a special constitutional statute dealing with the problem. I think that would be the ideal situation. I hope the Polish society will give a support like that. To some kind of political power, because if it if it doesn't, there is a problem. If we should repeat the sins of the law and justice, and I, I don't want to do this because you know the spiral of infringement of law cannot go up. Yeah? We need to finish it and to do this, do this legally. And for me, the only the only way of doing it legally is simply to have a supermajority again and to 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 I don't know to change the. Uh, I, I mean to 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 bring the Constitutional Tribunal to to a situation in which it is not paralyzed, to bring the public media to a situation in which they are independent, and so on and so on. A lot to do. I don't have clear plans, but for for sure it should be it should be legal tools, uh, lawful tools to do to to do so. So I would uh, answer the, the first question refers to Mecenas Vardinsky. So, of course, uh, what uh, uh, you say, but it is not true that we wa that the current government wants to uh, uh, restore the old times. Yes, it's not completely not true, Be um, because you say this is a kind of as to give the power to savage to the normal people. I agree with you, um, but to our, to our luck, the tolerance belongs, as I said maybe in the hall, to the, uh, the most important parts of Polish uh, uh, identity. I don't have any fears that Pauls will prosecute <coughs> Jews uh, and people of other nationalities. Of, of course, there are some people of this kind, but the majority, and uh, uh, let's take as an example Kaczynski, has nothing to do with this. It's nothing to do with, with this. Uh, but of course, I agree with you that this restoration could be bad because our, we are good habits and bad habits. And I agree with you that bad habits, brutal habits, stupid habits should be eliminated. They should be eliminated. I give you one example. As I was as a young uh, uh, a relatively young man, a fellow of uh, Humboldt Foundation, we go together to uh, uh, different bars and pubs and so on. My colleagues from Germany ask me, Lech, why if you go um, uh, to the bar or uh, to, to the pub, you uh, gives a, a hint to girls to go as a friends. It is like, it is a completely stupid if we go to bed. It may be dangerous for, for girls. I agree with you. It is a kind of completely stupid habits. 
maybe in our public life is a lot of such habits. And I agree, such habits should be eliminated. Yes, should be by education, by, by another means of uh, 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 taking influence uh, on other people. Yes, and. Uh, Okay, maybe I say fewer uh, because I lost my <laughs> story, my, my narrative. Yes, if I remember what I wanted I, uh, to say, I uh, will be asking for a uh, voice again. Yeah? Uh, I don't know if you have a question as well. Is it, would you like to respond or was there one question? Yeah, well, one question from Martin actually about yes. this self-defense of the institution. I understand that this discussion about self-defense is in a, when we could identify the shields and swords, actually, which means in the sort of the institutionally established order. When is a creation of the order, is a fighting for the shields and swords, it means it's, it's how much each institution will get. And in such sense, I said that, well, okay, it's not, not a question of fighting, it's a question of the construction, in, in the process of the <coughs> construction, is also included process of development of this self-defense by the particular institution. But what interests me when you ask this question is a different situation. I mean, a situation which probably could be described the best, the best in a socio-legal way. But generally, law itself is a self-defense mechanism, right, for the for the citizens. What about the situation in which this mechanism does not work? Which means when the social Mm, context is such that the, self the law as a self-defense mechanism possesses a limited character. It means it works only for some but does not work for others at all. But I don't have the answer to this last question which was triggered by your, your question. Uh, just one short rebuttal answer to Professor Moraski relating to Lauzi case. I, I think that Lauzi case rather supports that's what I said, and uh, uh, does not deny that. Maybe, uh, just to make it clear, Lausi case is a famous European case relating to displaying of cross <coughs> in Italian schools. Mrs. Lausi, I believe she was, uh, she was Finnish, yeah? Yeah, not, uh, even not a citizen of Italy. But so, she finally lost, correct? I, of course, it would be nonsense to say that minority is always right and majority wrong. <laughs> that no, would be nonsense. But what was the important? Should what? not be touched. In, no, no. And in what was Italian important schools. in this case? What was because important is that her claims were taken seriously, seriously considered by courts of various things, and finally yeah. she lost. But she, she has no reason to complain. There's not so that said, no, you are, you are, uh, actually, so we are not going to consider, consider your claims. So, uh, so what I have in mind is that not that my not is always right. are written yeah. only for minorities, and I can not agree with such position. Uh, uh, majority just don't read the constitution because it can enforce everything what he wants. The problem is that today you are in majority, tomorrow you may be in okay. minority. So you may always uh, uh, say that in Jacob. I don't question this. Of course. I made a solemn promise to uh, some, some of the speakers and attendees that we will finish on time because there are trains uh, and planes to catch. So, um, please join me in thanking uh, all the panelists and commentators and, and uh, to those of you who um, have spoken up. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for coming.